Sometimes you have people at the at the restaurant. Can I have some ketchup? We don't allow that here. We don't give extra ketchup. Really? Read the sign. I saw you gave it to your cousin. That was about right before you gave him four extra ketchups. You can't give me a ketchup? I know you have the Izzah. And you're acting like you're working under the mulk. The strangest of seed of Quran ever. <laughs> <laughs>
So who did they call Al-Aziz? Yusuf. So Yusuf used to be the slave of Al-Aziz and eventually took his job and became Al-Aziz himself. So he was the minister and that's one of the words in Arabic for the minister. So similarly, there are, you know, in the Quran, Allah describes a person being thrown into hellfire that used to have a lot of uh, power in Mecca. And he says, Look, taste this hell. Innaka antal azizul kareem. You're the aziz, right? Please, sir, enjoy this. You know, so this sarcastically, they're being made to taste the punishment of hell because they used to use their power in the wrong way. And the aziz also, so, and, and, and this is an observation we will get into when we finish this discussion. 47 of these times, so 89 times altogether, 47 times Allah uses this word with al hakim, al aziz, al hakim. Or Azizun Hakim or Azizan Hakima. So two names of Allah paired together. You should know from my own studies, I'll share with you my own theory on what I find the most convincing approach to studying the names of Allah in the Quran. You know, people say, Well, why don't you do a series on the names of Allah? It's like if it was that easy. I could I wish it was. It's not that simple. So here's what just some things that you might benefit from that will help you in your own pondering and your own study and your own thinking about the names of Allah. Every name of Allah has a unique identity. So you should ponder Al-Malik by itself, Al-Quddus by itself, Al-Aziz by itself, Al-Hakim by itself. Every one of them has their own unique identity. But then what Allah does is sometimes He puts two of His names together. When He puts them together, each one of them still has their own unique identity, but together they create a new meaning. They create a third meaning. So there's the meaning of A, there's a meaning of B, but A and B together create the meaning of C. So there's a C meaning also that happens, you know, like in chemistry, you have one element and two element and they have a chemical reaction and now it's a compound. It's a different thing now. It's, it's similar to that. So Ghafoor has its own qualities. Rahim has its own qualities. But Ghafoor and Rahim together also have a third quality, a unique distinction. So Al-Aziz al-Hakim comes together many, many times. Which means Al-Aziz has qualities, Al-Hakim has qualities, and together they have a unique distinction, which we'll get to when we get towards the end. Okay, now, Aziz, the, I'll tell you some things about the word Aziz, the two basic meanings. One is power and strength that cannot be overcome, the unbeatable one. If someone is Aziz, they are unbeatable, okay? Someone has Izza, they are unbeatable, okay? This word is used even like for, for example, um, uh, by Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu where he says أَعَزَّنَ اللَّهُ بِالْإِسْلَامِ نَحْنُ قَوْمٌ أَعَزَّنَ اللَّهُ بِالْإِسْلَامِ We are a people, Allah made us unbeatable because of Islam. وَإِذِ ابْتَغَيْنَ الْعِزَّ مِنْ غَيْرِهِ أَذَلَّنَ اللَّهُ And when we seek power from anyone other than Him, Allah will make us weak. Allah will make us. So, Azza there could mean power. But Azza has another meaning and that's respect rank or respect. When someone has more izza than you, then they have a higher level of respect. So now we've got two meanings, unbeatable power and what? Respect. So we should understand why those two things are together in this word. Is it possible you respect someone but they don't have a lot of power? Yeah. You could have somebody who's a very wise, you know, old man. You have a lot of respect for him, but he has no power. Uh, I think that Yaqub was very wise and respected, but he lived a life where he was mostly not empowered. He didn't have any izza in his family. He didn't have any control over his sons. Didn't, isn't that the case? So he has respect without power. Is it possible you have power without respect? Yeah, all the time. Like how you feel about the police sometimes. They may have power, but you don't respect it. Or you don't like it. Or a judge may have power, but the people he's judging may not respect him, may not like him. Or a president in the country may have power, but people don't respect him or her. You understand? So it's possible to have power without respect. It's also possible to have respect without power. Those, those two things can happen. Sometimes even, if you don't have to think about government. You can think of a family. It could be a, the head of a household, a father in the household or the head of the household has a lot of power, but has no respect. And sometimes he's a very respectable man, but nobody treats him right in the family. He has no power. So those two things can exist without each other. They're exclusive. But when you have someone who has the highest power and at the same time gets the highest level of 
respect. Together, that becomes a Aziz. Aziz is when both of those things combine in one figure. And that is Allah's name, Al-Aziz. We Allah has the ultimate might, the power, and He is also the, the worthy of the highest level of respect. Okay? Which is interesting because in Al-Aziz, you've got something from Al-Malik, which is about power, and there's something respectable, which is in Al-Quddus. Right? So it's actually taking elements from both and build, building up on that in the word Al-Aziz. Okay. Now, Al-Aziz, مَنْ كَانَ يُرِدُ الْعِزَّةِ فَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةُ جَمِيعًا Whoever wants Izza, Allah says, Allah owns all of it. You know what this means? This is a this is a concept in the Quran. That means anyone who ever has any power or anyone who ever has any respect in this world, they didn't get it themselves. That came from Allah. That came from so my power over anything and my respect, the respect that I have in a, in a society, the respect that I even have for myself, it wasn't generated by me. It was generated by Allah. فَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةُ جَمِيعًا to izzu man tasha wa to dhillu man tasha. You can humiliate who you can empower and honor whoever you want. You can humiliate and weaken whoever you want. Was kur abdana Dawud. I love this phrase. Dawud alayhi salam is one of the most uh, powerful, uh, politically powered uh, and empowered prophets in history. Right? He was a he was a massive ruler and he had great great empire under him. Okay. And Allah, when He describes him, He describes him as Allah's slave. So he, it's a story about how powerful Dawood is, but his first introduction is he's Allah's what? Slave. Just to remind that actually his power is nothing because he's just a slave of Allah. All power actually comes from Allah. His izzah came from Allah Azza wa Jal. And so usually subjugation, when somebody overpowers you, somebody forces you to do something, somebody tells you, you know, like for example, if people are arresting a person, right? They're making them put their hands behind their back and they're putting handcuffs on them. It's humiliating, isn't it? When someone overpowers you, it's humiliating. If two brothers are having an argument or a fight and one brother pins the other one down on the ground and says, say sorry, say sorry and I'll let you go. Say, I'm never going to say it. Say it, say it. And then he finally says sorry. Is that humiliating? Yep, yep. And then when he finally lets him go, I didn't mean it. And then he runs away because he's trying to recover his dignity. All right. That never happened to me. I don't have brothers. I'm just saying. Okay. <laughs> so... Azani fil qitab, he's humiliating me. In other words, when someone exacts their izza on you, then it is, it is humiliating. You know, sometimes you may have authority, but you don't use it. Right? I, I have an authority as a boss in my company. I have authority over my employees. And if my employees mess up, they, and they come to me and say, hey, hey I'm, I'm, I really messed up, I'm sorry. I have two choices. I could be Aziz right now and say, oh yeah? Oh, you messed up. Let's go over it again. And I could humiliate the guy. I could humiliate him. Or I could just say, it's okay, just, you know, don't worry about it. It happens. When I do that, don't worry about it, it happens. I didn't exercise my right as what? As Aziz. And I'll show you. Maybe I was being Hakim at the time. You get what I'm saying? Because I could be Aziz right then and there, but I decide... You know what? Longer term, I would rather this person make that correction themselves and maybe me forgiving them this time will build more respect for me in their heart and they will develop more loyalty instead of developing resentment. So maybe longer term, it's better for them that I right now don't exercise my izza. I exercise my what? Hikmah. So I, I choose to step on the accelerator or release the accelerator depending on the next. Do you see how there's a relationship between the two? Right? By way, by, by way of that example? Okay. So now, let's talk a little bit more about the two names that are similar in these four names. Al-Malik and Al-Quddus are similar. Why? Al-Malik means king and Al-Aziz means authority. Right? So they both have to do with power, control, and authority. So then what's the difference? What, what, how would you understand the difference between them? A really cool place to understand the difference between them is Surah Yusuf. Because Surah Yusuf uses Al-Malik as one character and so Yusuf uses Al-Aziz as another character in the same story. So the king of Egypt is called Al-Malik. But the minister is called Al-Aziz. Now, how many people here have businesses? If they have a business? Very few. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. If, I was, if I asked this question in America, most people would have raised their hand. We're an entrepreneurial nation. Anyway. So, 
if you have a, if somebody has a business they own the business they in, in, they invested in the business let's just say i want to sometimes you have something called a passive investor he says hey i'm going to give you my money you buy this this building you find the tenants you run it you manage it you're the manager i'm the owner okay so the one who owns it does he check every day no he just checks in 6 months how's the financial report am i making money or not and every day if somebody didn't pay their rent or somebody has an electrical problem, somebody has a gas problem, somebody has this problem or that problem, who's dealing with that? Not the, not the investor, not the owner, but the, the manager. The manager is dealing with it, right? So the owner handed power over to the manager. Now think about government. There's the king and the king says, I want to collect taxes from every farmer. But the king is not going to go collect the taxes. The king is going to tell his military general. The military general is going to tell his lieutenants. The lieutenants are going to tell their lieutenant battalion commanders. The battalion commanders are going to tell their individual soldiers. Each individual soldier is going to go knock on the door. Is the king going and knocking on the door? No. So the king is actually powerful, but by proxy. Not directly, but by pro it's indirect. You understand? So... A lot of times when you would deal with authorities, like the police, the police was given the authority by the state, right? So that when the police stops me, it's not actually because of that person's power, it's the power that was granted to him by proxy from the mulk, from the governance, you understand? So the malik, the king, the term is actually about power that is the, the top command is issued by the malik, but then it is executed by people in the lower ranks. Now let's go to the lowest rank. Let's go to, let's say, one police officer or one soldier. The king made the order, I want to collect taxes. And then there's, you know, he's A, there's B, C, D, F, E, F, G, H, and all the way down to, to X is the soldier at the bottom of that chain of command, all the way almost at the bottom. When he goes to collect taxes, he beats the guy up. Or he takes a little bit less than he should take. Or he takes more than he should take. Why? Because in that moment, who has all the authority? The soldier does. He's actually Aziz in that situation. There's the Malik up there, and there's the Aziz down here. The Aziz is the one who actually exercises his power and exercises his authority. And these are usually two separate things. You have people that run for the presidency or the prime ministership in different countries. They have elections. They say, I will execute this policy, this policy, this policy. They win the power and then they're not able to implement their own policies because they may have mulk, but they don't seem to have what? Izza. They're not able to execute because the people under them are not listening to them or they're not following what they, they say they should do, be doing. You understand? When a business is not succeeding, then the owner says, I need new management. Because I have the mulk, but I don't have the what? I don't have the izza. I need new management because they're going to do better izza job for me. You understand? So Allah takes both mulk and izza. He's al-malik and he's al-aziz. You see why that's powerful? Because now not a leaf moves without Allah's power and authority. No one gets humiliated and or honored except by Allah's command. You know? Teachers, I, I, I'll give you one last example. Teachers, there's a, there's a policy in the school that if you fail your exam, you will no longer be graduating, right? But that's the policy on top. And the principal has hired the department heads, the headmasters for each department. And then the departments have hired the teachers. And the teacher is the one who actually has authority over the student. And the student failed the exam by two points. According to the mulk of the school, this student should be expelled or they cannot move to the next grade but the teacher says hey just do this extra assignment i'll give you an extra two points i'll let you pass because in the end who had the izza the teacher did sometimes you have people at the at the restaurant can i have some ketchup we don't allow that here we don't give extra ketchup really read the sign i saw you gave it to your cousin that was about right before you gave him four extra ketchups you can't give me a ketchup i know you have the izza and you're acting like you're working under the mulk. The strangest of seed of Quran. <laughs> but you understand the difference between these two? And how Allah is the highest authority and the most intimate, immediate authority also between both of these names. Why was it important for Yusuf to take over 
the Aziz role when the king is already there. Because the king does not know how to execute all of these, the crisis, the economic crisis. Who has the capability of doing that? Yusuf alayhi So even though there was a malik, a Aziz was needed. This is the concept of kingdom and authority that sometimes gets separated. But Allah doesn't allow for them to be separated. And he says he's malik and he's also an Aziz. Both, both combined together. Okay? So, now throughout human history, someone seizing power or taking the throne needs to settle into the throne, stabilize the kingdom, establish his authority. One might become al-malik but and be considered good, quddus, but still not become al-aziz. That's another point. You know, when people become newly appointed, then their government is stable or unstable still? Unstable. They say, oh, let's see how the first hundred days go. Or if it's a new king, let's see if he gets assassinated in the first week. Let's see if his brother kills him. Let's see if his uncle kills him. You know, back in the day, sometimes they would be in the Chinese emperors amongst, among them, for example, a four-year-old would become the ruler. He's just sitting there in his diapers. He's ruling China, you know? Because they're like, I don't know who's going to come and kill him. So he's got mulk, but his authority is not settled. It's not actually, so he's not invincible. He's not, he's not someone who cannot be overpowered. So it's shaky. So he's got mulk, but he doesn't have izza. Allah is al-malik and al-aziz at the same time. Okay, so now uh, let's talk about Al-Aziz and Al-Hakim. Actually, let me tell, tell you a little bit about Al-Hakim and then we'll talk about that. And then I'll give you a first break. Uh, so, hik or Hakama, this is actually the first word, Hakamatul Insan wa Da'ina. Hakama means the chin. There's a weird concept in Arabic. The chin or this jawbone is called Hakama for human beings, it's also called that for, for sheep. And the idea is it holds your face together. It holds your face in place. This isn't there, you know. So, مَنَعَهَا مِنَ التَّفَكُّكُ وَالتَّسَيُّبُ سَوَاءٌ كَانَتْ مَعْدِيَةً أَوْ مَعْنَوِيَةً أَوْ كَلَامًا Meaning something that prevents something else from falling apart. The idea is the chin is keeping your face from falling apart. Okay. It's also, إِحْكَام was also used for when they put the saddle on a horse. Sometimes they put a thing on a horse's chin and then you pull on it. You pull on its neck, right? That's actually an إِحْكَام also. When a building is well structured, so it won't fall apart, the foundations are strong, the pillars are strong, they say, Uhkimatil bina. Uhkimatil bina. And from it came the word hukum, which you might be familiar with. Hukum means a verdict or a decision. And a hakim is a ruler, right? But a ruler who makes firm decisions, well thought out decisions. From this, we also get the idea of hikmah. Anyone know what hikmah means? Wisdom. The, the concept of wisdom in Arabic is really interesting. It is actually based on the idea that you've considered all of the factors and after considering all of the factors, you have an opinion that's very firmly rooted so that this decision you're making or this idea you have won't fall apart. You know, it's not whimsical. It's not flimsy. It's very well thought out. It's, it's secure, like the chin holding the face secure, right? Or the building being well built. Ideas that are well built, well tested, they don't fall apart. They, the, the sum of those ideas become hikmah. They become wisdom. Okay? So he says, The best of knowledge, based on the best of knowledge and the best of know-how, you understand how to take the best course of action. That would be hikmah. Hikmah is also used in Arabic for wise sayings. I got to learn some German wise sayings before I go. Everywhere I go, I, gotta, I have to learn some wise sayings. Like I learned one wise saying in uh, in Malaysia, I'm going to bu butcher it. They say, do it first, say sorry later. <laughs> because if you ask permission first, what are they going to say? No. So just do it and then say sorry. <laughs> Very wise. Yeah, it really works. Okay. <laughs> Don't try this at all. <laughs> Especially not in Islam, like do it first and then, ya sorry Allah. <laughs> the Malaysian wisdom. <laughs> anyway, so uh, the idea of wisdom in, uh, in Islamic literature, hikmah, is actually a really strong idea. Tomorrow, I'm probably going to have a special 30-minute session with you guys just on wisdom because this is a huge concept. And we have very, a variety of ideas of what wisdom means. Right? And we, I want to get, get develop a Quran-inspired concept of what it means to have wisdom. So this is Allah's name, Al-Hakim, which basically comes down to two things. The decision maker 
but the decision maker who makes decisions based on wisdom. Okay, so he has hukum, which means he has the power to make decisions, but he makes them based on wisdom. And wisdom means you considered all the factors, right? A, 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 a hakim is different from a qadi. A qadi just makes a judgment. A hakim says, oh, you have, a, you have a situation, you want me to solve it? Let me find out all the other witnesses, all the other situations, because if I make this decision, who else will this impact? What will be the trickle effect? You know, like the butterfly effect thing? What will be the domino effect of this decision? If I considered everything that I made a decision, that would be a hakim because he used proper hikmah. Okay? Now, Al-Aziz and Hakim are paired together 47 times in the Quran, so we should learn something about that. If, let's think about a human being before we think about Allah. If a human being has complete authority, you can do whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. You have complete power. Authority that is unquestioned can often be associated with unwise, rash, and unilateral decisions. I'm going to do whatever I want because I'm the king. I, want, I, I said I want this. I said kill that person. I said let this one go. I, you know, and you just become a, 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 like a tantrum child. You can just do whatever you want because you have no controls over you. That's why rulers of the past had wise counsel. And even now, presidents have a cabinet, right? An advisor, strategic advisors. So the president says, ah, man, these, you know, like, like in sitting in America, some president can say, these Russians, they're annoying me. Let's bomb them. And then I'm just in the mood to bomb while he's eating his French fries, right? Then the strategic, sir, actually, it will cause this following chain of effect, and this is going to affect the economy in this way, and politics in this way, and this and this way. <sighs> Can't bomb anyone. It's been so long. It's been like three months I didn't bomb anyone. Like, <laughs> in other words, if you just have absolute authority, then it will create disaster in, hu in the human realm. In the human realm. And so, human beings, since the beginning, whenever you have authority, they have to have some kind of what? Counsel. Some kind of wise counsel. And if you don't have that, they have, for example, in the American constitutional system, they have something called checks and balances. They didn't want to give the president all the authority. The government was divided into the executive branch, the legislative branch, the ju judicial branch, three different branches. Why? Because if you give all the authority to the president, then that's going to turn into a dictatorship and it's going to be unwise. Right? So you have to break up the authority. The izza is actually broken up. And they thought this would be the, the, a wiser approach. It can also be associated with whimsical decisions that sway from one direction to another spontaneously. In other words, one day the king says, Get out of here, I never want to see you again. The next day he says, hey, where's that guy? I miss him, I like his jokes. The king can change his mood, split second, and the whole law changes in the country. If you're living in a dictatorship, your entire nation depends on the king's mood because he's running a dictatorship. And this is not just about kings and large authorities. Sometimes you have dictators in a family. Sometimes you have dictators in a company. The owner of the company, just one day we're going this way, one day we're going that way. One day you're fired, one day you're hired. You know, you, you never know based on their mood. So what is missing when people tend to have authority? Wisdom seems to be missing. Take back, step back, consider all the factors before you make a decision. Know what you're, what you're getting, what are the ramifications? What are the consequences? Are you going to be taking this decision back tomorrow? Is this just emotion or is this actually well thought out? Meaning in, 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 in the world, in life, when we think of izza, Many times, the more izzah someone has, the less hikmah they have. The less hikmah they have. Allah Azza wa Jal describes Himself perfectly as Aziz, but at the, and separately as Al Hakim. But now they're together. He's the only Aziz that's truly also what Al Hakim. This is His authority, always executed with the highest levels of wisdom, and even above all of that, Allah says about Himself. So those, those two names have something to do with each other. But we, there's two other names we didn't compare to each other, which are Al-Quddus and Al-Hakim. Al-Quddus is the sanctified one, and it's connected with heavenly matters, as we talked about before, right? So the spiritual matters, the matters of goodness and, um, and morality. They, are, they exist in reclusion, meaning they don't deal with worldly things. I don't want to know about the market. I don't, know what, I don't want to know about the social situation or the political situation. I just want to know about what's happening, what, what's right and wrong in the heavenly sense, in the spiritual sense. The wise counsel, and by the way, kings in the past, they had two kinds of advisors. They had the spiritual advisor 
and they had the strategic advisors. Okay, so the, the king would go to the pope or the church or whatever for blessings and prayers and what should I do? And they would go to their military advisors and their economic advisors for what should I do? And were they always on the same page, these two advisors? No, they hate each other. Like, why is he listening to him? Why is he listening to him? I remember when the first time a Catholic became president of the United States and John F. Kennedy became president, there was a whole issue in the U U.S. about, well, he's Catholic, so is he loyal to the Constitution or is he loyal to the Pope? And if he goes and has a conversation with the Pope and the Pope tells him, issue this policy, go against this policy, is he going to follow that or that? Where is his loyalty? Be you know, Is he going to follow his counsel coming from the Muqaddas side or is he going to follow his actual cabinet, the Hikmah side? Two different sides. And so, in a sense, the Muqaddas class concerns itself with the inwardly and the wise counsel with the outwardly. Allah needs no counsel. Allah needs no ex inwardly. He is himself Al-Quddus and he is himself Al-Hakim. No other king can be this. No other king can be like this. So this, in, in this way, now, now you'll understand this point, kings had two kinds of counsel in the past, spiritual and strategic. Many times the two were at odds with each other. Allah in these names establishes the most complete description of kingdom. His kingdom en en encompasses righteous holiness, direct authority with invincible power, wisdom and secure governance, taking all factors into account, meaning this is the most perfect kind of kingdom. And on top of that, then Allah, then you understand what Allah says when He says, فَعَالٌ لِمَا يُرِيدٌ He does whatever He wants. Now when He says you, He does whatever He wants, it's not like when a human being does whatever they want. This is a higher level of whatever He wants. And so now you come back to this tasbih and we end this session. This description covers every flaw that all kingdoms otherwise have. You can have a kingdom that doesn't have the authority. You can have a kingdom that isn't righteous. You can have a kingdom that doesn't have the wise counsel. You can have things missing. But the focus on وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ in يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ is kinaya that it is time that people of the world recognize this truth and were introduced to Allah's perfect kingdom. They need to, re when they recognize who Allah is, they'll recognize what the perfect kingdom of Allah looks like. There must be some perfect way to introduce them to this king so they too become people of what? Tasbih. If the kingdom is perfect, then that king deserves to be considered perfect. And if you consider someone perfect, what do you do of them? You do tasbih of them. Now you understand the logic of the ayah. يُسَبِّحُ لِلَّهِ مَا فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ الملك, القدوس, العزيز, As we get to the end of this ayah, now we will see, now that Allah has described Himself as the perfect king, and everybody does this, all the rest of creation know this, it seems the only ones who don't really know this are human beings, there must be a way for human beings to get to know this king, and how perfect he is, and that's what the subject matter of the second ayah is going to be. I'll give you guys your first break. Barakallahu li wa lakum, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Here's what's coming up in the next episode and this deeper look of Surat Al-Jumu'ah. So when you develop that love of, of Qur'an, of contemplation, of study, then the way you're going to start talking about it. You don't have, you're, you're not going to have to take some course on public speaking or how do I, you know, you're not, your aim is not to become a public speaker or a, an influencer. Most influencers are influenced or under the influence. But the... the, but the <laughs> But the, the, the idea isn't you want to become a public figure. The idea is you should be able to speak passionately about something that inspires you.